The first one I want to introduce is Robert Forbus. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science. Uh, his research interests are primarily concerned with environmental politics and policy with an emphasis on the policy nexus of environmental protection and energy development. His research specifically addresses uh, political conflicts uh, triggered by the hydraulic fracturing or fracking as we all know it, uh, energy resource development process. He uh, teaches courses in public lands and resource management, sustainability, <coughs> energy, and environmental policy. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Forbes. This is going to be a, kind of a quasi sort of take on a paper that I just finished presenting at San Diego at the Western Political Science Conference. And one of the reasons I want to emphasize this is because this is about a shift to renewable alternatives and the political conflicts that have been triggered by that shift. Uh, most primarily that political conflict has been triggered by solar. And I'm co-authoring this with Michael Gerberson. And I want you to notice that I'm coming from the Department of Political Science and the Climate Science Center. Dr. Gerberson's coming from the Rawls uh, Free Market Institute. And there's a reason why this is particularly true because the conflict in many ways with solar panels or, or solar installation is kind of a grassroots thing. You've got utility monopolies who are going to utility commission meetings in the states and they're trying to reverse what's known as a net metering fee. The traditional net metering fee was in a sense if you produced energy, you were paid or you bill was reduced because you were producing energy to the line, to the grid. Um, but more and more persons are installing solar, small businesses are installing in solar. And so the utility monopolies, the big companies now have gone to these commissions and sought to reverse the net metering fee. And now they want to charge you for hooking up to the line for maintenance purposes and so on and so forth. And as we get into, Texas has come up with a rather unique way of, of dealing with this. But first, I kind of need to understand the, the history and future of competition because basically these big companies are very risk averse. And we've known for quite some time from the 1940s that over time this, this particular uh, use, or use of fossil fuels to, to generate electricity would eventually go away uh, once we have the technological capacity and, and once we figured out that a return on the investment or ROI would shrink over time, and that's become very true lately. And basically what we're saying is that ultimately these industries have to embrace this technology because it will make things better all the way around, not just simply for society, but for the climate as well. So what's this looking like? Well, this comes from U.S. News and World Report last year. And basically the argument is being made, and it has been for a while, that we're in the middle of an economic transformation that's based on energy. Um, as they say, this new transformation will be seen most clearly in two sectors, transportation and utility. By 2030, which is not far off, the transformation will be nearly complete. And uh, basically they're making the argument that the age of fossil fuels is coming to an end. Now I want to stress one caveat to that sort of declaration is that we will always need oil and gas. There is no possible way to completely rid ourselves of, of fossil fuels but we can reduce our consumption of them to the greatest degree possible. And that's where the new technologies come in. So what we're seeing is drop in prices, big time. Uh, coal, in terms of its economics, has gone down almost 30% by 2016. Natural gas has dropped by 50%, and oil, 70%. Which means it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, but there's an interesting dynamic going on in that we're not consuming as much. The old way of thinking was kind of the energy paradox, is that the cheaper the energy got, the more we used. And so supply and demand, and this is why we go through boom and bust cycles with fossil fuels. But here's the annual investment in renewables. It's climbing, it's going off the charts. And basically what they're arguing is Bloomberg Economics is basically saying that by 2035, we should reach $350 billion in capital investment in renewables. That is a big time shift. So what's the economic arguments? Well, coal and gas fired electricity is becoming more expensive and profits less predictable. Uh, the opposite is true of wind and solar. Um, wind power, including U.S.
U.S. subsidies became the cheapest electricity in the United States for the first time last year. And solar power is a bit further behind in that model, but the costs are dropping rapidly, especially those associated with financing a new project. The old return on investment cycle was anywhere between 15 and 20 years. And now, if you're a private investor, so you own a home and you want to put solar panels up, with all the sort of market and government subsidies and machinations and new technology, your return on investment has now shrunk to three to five years, which isn't very long. So, how are we growing? Well, you're, you'll be here from Steve here pretty soon from uh, LPNL. It's basically solar installation installations have more than broad, broadened more than tenfold in the past five years. Uh, utility scale solar in 2007. Uh, basically, there were there were zero utility scale. Now there are hundreds across the United States, um, and in California, dozens and dozens of 10 and 20 and 50 megawatt projects across the United States. Big solar plants provide measly. It's 0.6 percent of all our overall electricity, but in 2015, it accounted for 50 for 57 percent of all new installed solar capacity. Um, according to the EIA, the Energy Information. Administration, 9.5 gigawatts of utility solar is scheduled for installation in this year alone. Uh, that's more than any other single energy source, including natural gas. So, what are the strengths? Well, the price. The price of solar is getting cheaper. And in terms of its predictability, you know what solar power costs. Solar costs, so your solar cost is basically the PV installation. After that, how much does it cost to draw energy from the sun? Nothing. It's, it's zero. There is no fuel cost. So in strength, more states are beginning to have plant, plants. The weakness at this point is the capacity of the power plant in terms of capable of producing generated electricity around the clock. So that capacity factor, although the technology is rapidly catching up with it. And as they argue, big solar is about to get unstoppable. It basically has outgrown the, the first machinations of policy and will outgrow the latter in, in the next five years. So the argument made here in Lubbock, and I did this in December at the time but it last, the argument made here in Lubbock is that it's too dusty, that solar panels will lose their efficiency because wind blows here all the time and it's dusty constantly, and solar panels covered in dust basically will lose their capacity to generate electricity. So this is a picture from an airplane of a haboob rolling in, as we're all familiar with across the plane. And this is that same haboob coming into Lubbock. And that's what it looks like when we've seen it. Those of us who've lived here long enough, we've seen it. But here's the interesting thing. Who can tell me what this is? Those of you who went to the December Science for the last year, not allowed to answer. Anybody? This would be a picture of Mars. This is a, a dust uh, storm in Mars. The dust storms in Mars are global in their, in their reach. They're not just centrally located. And one of the reasons that I found this so fascinating is because after I'd heard that solar capacity was marginalized by the dust storms and the dust here in Lubbock, I was laying in bed watching a National Geographic special on the Mars rover. And what they said was, you're right, the dust comes up, it covers the panels, and we lose it, you know, capacity to generate electricity and move the rover around. But then the wind picks up again, and it blows all the dust off. And they basically were saying that we have to be very careful about how much we run the Mars rover for fear of burning the batteries out because it's producing so much energy. So the question becomes, if the argument is, is that it's too dusty and windy here, well, you telling me that Lubbock's environment is, is worse than Mars. Um, it really doesn't fit logically. So what's the potential? This is from the Energy Information Agency. The yellow dots are existing solar, and uh, this is a, a, a dated version because my TA took a picture of the town. Bakersfield. Bakersfield. There's a whole new solar plant going up at Bakersfield. Um, so this needs to be updated a little bit, but you can see by the color, the basic colors here, is that the darker the area, the greater capacity there is for solar, and yet there's only really four solar plants out there. So the capacity for growing large solar absent just the localized grassroots movement is still enormous. In Texas wind, it goes to wind, for the um, there's a lot of wind around here, and I know Steve's going to touch on it here a little bit later on, but there's still enormous room for growth, for capacity building. In terms of the capital investment, 
These are 2012 numbers, 452 billion in, from the government to support fossil fuel production as compared to 121 billion for renewable energy. And we fast, this is 2012 private investment, 674 billion and 281 in renewables. So it was still favored fossil fuels. And so the coal industry argues that we're gonna lose jobs and so on and so forth. There's a lobbying effort to prevent these sorts of these transitions. And the groups that are attacking solar across the United States are numerous, but if you dig deeper into these, so the American Legislative Council, ALEC, is the leading sort of uh, a force behind all this. This is a group that is funded primarily from fossil fuel industries, the Koch brothers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they recently had some success in Nevada, who had the state which has the highest potential for, uh, for solar. Um, they basically went with the model that Customers were going to pay the net meter fee rather than to receive the benefits. And on the day the law took effect, every one of the private solar uh, industry persons out of Silicon Valley that were operating in Nevada left the state. So in a sense, solar has come to an abrupt halt in Nevada. Uh, Robert? Yes. If you collapse those garbage that I saw, I'll make it in several of those states. Right. I have some floaters in my eyes and my private vision is collapse the number of groups, how many groups are we really looking at in total? About eight or ten, eight to ten. Eight to ten. All of them in some form or fashion are being funded and created by the fossil fuel industry. These are where these groups are working in terms of state legislatures and uh, utility committees <coughs> to battle the, the grassroots efforts uh, to not reverse the net meter increase. And so this kind of gets you down to what you were talking about, crunching. This is a one focus on Kansas, but if you notice there's, what, three, six, there's basically eight. So in any, in any given state, there's eight to ten of these that are working. Alex's argument basically says that those uh, increase, those using home solar will increase fees for users who are free riders to the utility companies. This is an unfair advantage, they argue. They also argue that because they're not receiving profits, they're going to have to charge more for traditional <coughs> utility, and those persons who can't afford to do the solar are going to bear the burden of their ability to make money. What's interesting from Dr. Gerberson's perspective, and mine as well, is that these utility companies, in a sense, and I use this term absolutely intentionally, are dinosaurs. And the reason being is because they are risk averse. They're not shifting their ability to alter their business plan to address the current, the current market. Bloomberg News, kind of repetitive, but basically 2030, 60, 30 billion dollars. And by 2030, 73% of total capital investment will be in renewables. The yellow, as you can see, is all solar. The blue is in wind. The green is in uh, uh, biomass. Purple and geothermal and hydro. And you get down here to the bottom, nuclear oil, gas, coal, these are all shrinking tremendously. So why is this important for climate? Well, we can go along the business as usual path. This is from Dr. Hayhoe. Um, at plus three degrees per year, basically you can see the, the, the worst case scenario. And down here in the green is the 2.6 model. The only way we get to 2.6, according to Catherine and, and, and others, is if we shift our economic sort of balance away from fossil fuels and towards these renewables. In that way, we hit the 2.6. We no longer go along what Catherine refers to as the doomsday path, but rather along what she refers to as the fairy dust path. So, in conclusion, it is a green economy we're looking for, although there are those who would say that, um, as this one points out, uh, a green economy bears no electricity. That's simply not true. 